Clarity chat room. I am your host today, Chernell Marshall. And we're looking again at the topic, social media, toxic or transformational. And my guest again to look at that topic is Mr. Arnell Gosling of Echo Nation. Welcome again, Arnell. It's a pleasure to be here. So we're excited to move on today as we look at communication and social skills. So it is argued that social media helps us to develop good communication and social skills. Is this true? Um, yes, there are some people who've argued that um, social media, one of the benefits of social media is that it helps us to develop better social skills. It helps us to feel less isolated. It helps us to bond with friends and family, to be more creative and share ideas, you know, with friends and, and to be better equipped as citizens to be active, you know. And to some extent, there is that is true. We, we are, especially when we look at COVID, how um, with school and with other things, we see how it is necessary for children to have these tools in order to stay connected, in order to um, express themselves or these forms of expression. Um, but the, uh, the question is really, is it genuinely helping us to communicate better? Is it helping us to be authentic with um, how we connect with one another? Are we being authentic with how we feel? Are we being authentic in terms of what we say? Because we can get very comfortable uh, being behind the screens. So what some um, research has shown in essence is that some young people or some children may have we feel comfortable communicating behind the screen or through texting or whatever, um, but when coming to actual face-to-face -face interaction, uh, that is where they, they find it difficult you now to be expressive and the actual social skills in connecting to people face-to-face -face or even with a camera uh, becomes even more um, difficult. So what I'm here you say about social skills and communication. I want to separate the two of those because you're saying they not, we use the word authentic, so I wanna come back to that catch word and mm -hmm. what exactly we mean by authenticity mm -hmm. in terms of communication. And you say they don't have the social skills when they're face to face. They might be more comfortable behind the screen. So for me, for example, I might feel I prefer to write. I am a writer, so I prefer to express myself in writing. Not so much in talking, face-to-face, one-on-one. I find I'm better. But that doesn't mean that I'm not authentically communicating. So how would you apply this then to social media if my preference is simply to text than for you to call me? For me, as I said, mm -hmm. my phone rings, not so much. If you text me, we can have a conversation. So am I not being authentic then? Um, I think that you're being expressive. It's not, it's not from that standpoint, it's not a matter of authentic, uh, authenticity. I think when we talk about being authentic, it is more of what social media has presented that allowed you to, that allow young people especially, to hide behind certain things. So for instance, um, if, if we want to go, you said let's separate the whole aspect of communication and social skills. So let's start with communication. What has been the language of social media? So we've now in the era of emojis and short codes and, and these type of things. We are texting a lot, as you said, we are voice notes. So all these things, um, we have the whole PM, DM and all these things that young people use in terms of their language when relating to social media. So one of the studies that we've been doing in the schools with the classes that we've conducted is that we ask young people for a simple thing, how many of you use LOL or the laugh out loud emoji or whatever and really and truly you didn't do it. You didn't smile, you didn't do anything like that. And a lot of them responded that yes, we do that. And they asked them, why is it that you do this? And they said, sir, it's because um, you don't want to hurt the other person's feelings. Mm -hmm. So I am not being authentic with how I feel in order to shelter the other person. So what happens here, it is easier for them to do it because like, if you are face to face with a person, um, your facial expression, your body language, all these things that help to communicate uh, more effectively uh, comes into question. So it's harder for you to be authentic with this fake identity. I don't want to hurt your feelings, but 
and, and force out a laugh, for instance. The people may be able to detect that. Uh, so that is what I say in, in terms of the authenticity. So young people say that, you know, because you don't want to hurt people's feelings or you want to fall in line of what is happening, what everybody's doing, you, all these things, it is easier to do that and basically fake it rather than if it is face to face with it's harder to face with all the different types of languages that we have in terms of our facial expressions, in terms of our body language, in terms of our tone and other things. So these are this that is why I, I mentioned the whole aspect of in terms of the authenticity. Um, from a communication standpoint, if we looking at how are we communicating socially, um, social media has its own language as well. Uh, I mentioned the short codes. So, for instance, um, if I say I want to DM you, it's totally different to if I say I want to slide into your DMs. All right, so we all know, or some of us may not know, but DM means direct message. So it's, a, it's basically I want to directly message you, whether it's in WhatsApp or on a social media platform. And it is inappropriate, and this is what young people say now, is inappropriate if a teacher, for instance, says, I want to slide into your DMs because that has a whole different connotation. Now, that's just a simple example here, but with the whole idea of using short codes now, and because they are so accustomed to using it in social media, um, not only the meaning of these short codes have weight, but now it is creeping into how they write compositions, how they, how they do comprehensions, how they answer the questions in a, a natural classroom environment. You will see that they prefer the convenience of writing IDK rather than writing I don't know. Or they prefer the convenience of writing all these short-term forms of our language rather than typing the full, the full thing out. And some, in some cases, they don't, even, they don't even know what the full thing is. All right, so that that is just an example. So now you've gone over to speaking about language and writing skills, would you then say, well, you kind of said it just now, that it is affecting the way that their, their language skills, it's affecting their spelling. So by writing short codes, I'm no longer writing full words. Full sentences as well. Right, so full words, full, and that, exactly. So you abbreviate even your sentences. So sentence structure has gone on this drain, you're perhaps mm -hmm. saying. So we're seeing our teachers have much more work to do then because of social media habits, like the short codes and, and even the emojis, because emojis can represent a whole sentence mm -hmm. or a whole word, a whole phrase. So when it comes, especially now that you are online schooling, Mm -hmm. and you're using your device much more than you would have. Because at school, I see there was a balance. When you were going to physical school, there was a balance between, I would say, having to write and mm -hmm. then, you know, going on your social media platforms. But now you're totally online. And I guess in some classes, you answer questions. Students might automatically reply to their teacher in short codes. In text, and actually, emoji. because of the you're using the device now with online classrooms, you're using the device now to respond. And usually, persons would respond in the chat. So the default with a device mm -hmm. may be to use those short forms, um, um, use these short codes, and use these different things. And um, in essence, uh, as you said, it, it changes a lot in terms of the landscape. And let me give another example: punctuation. Uh, we normally do a, a test in the, uh, what else? sort of like a test in the classroom where we give them a sentence. Uh, the sentence basically is, um, a woman without her man is useless. And we give them that simple phrase and we say to them, punctuate it to give meaning to that phrase. right? And that phrase can have a whole different meaning based on how you punctuate and so one of the things we recognize is that a lot of people do not use punctuation marks when they are messaging in a chat or wherever the case may be. So therefore, you are leaving it up to the other person to give meaning to what you're trying to say and in hope that I have effectively communicated uh, what I wanted to communicate with you. And that, and that is something that we also see happening a lot of the times because of the the, not the lack of punctuation marks or the lack of being able to um, use different things to enhance the meaning of what you're saying 
it is lost and a lot it left up to the interpretation of the receiver i find that quite interesting because it's not only now about our students or our young people but it's also in, in adult conversations and i you're sitting there and i'm thinking hmm it's true do i use punctuations when i'm texting i think i tend to because as i said i'm a writer so writing for me is automatic but oftentimes persons might send me a message and do not or they misunderstand what i have said because of and i would say did you not see the question mark did you not see the comma did you not see the colon so persons even although i may have written them because there's so much now reading on a device in open to interpretation persons read what they want to perceive mm -hmm. so because if as you said if i'm face to face my words go with my facial expression so that gives meaning or that gives weight to my words but there's no facial expression with social media and texting so therefore a lot of things gets misconstrued so i am going to ask you then because this i can, i perceive as a very interesting challenge for the school system for our teachers how, how then do you deal with this? Because we are created and it's like no fault of their own. What can we do? School needs to be online. And from what you said, and I have here, brain does not easily, paraphrasing, separate from school and social when using a device. So their default is to, I'm on a device, I'm in a chat, yes, it's school, but I'm not going to write out the full sentence to answer. And if I want to answer quickly, the easiest thing to do is to short code it or to send a a not properly structured sentence to my teacher so how can teachers get around this then this seems interesting i can't give the answer to that it's a is a very is a very complex situation and the reason why um because like for instance when we do classes we want the children's feedback we want to hear what they have to say and for them if you are going to give them the challenge of properly structuring a sentence and to give meaning to what they're trying to say, then it is a situation where they may be reluctant now to want to express because for me, my brain is evaluating. Um, it is not convenient for me to do this. But I think what teachers have to do is to recognize that children and teach the discipline that convenience does not always equal effectiveness. And, and that is one of the things in our classes we, we recognize. We ask students, for instance, what's the most effective way of communication based on expression, on authenticity, based on all these different things, with different ways to evaluate the effectiveness of communication. And when we went through that exercise with them, they realized for themselves that using these emojis and short codes are not really um, as effective. Using texting in some cases may not be as effective. Um, in some other cases, speech may not be as effective as using face-to-face -face communication. Um, so I think we as, as teachers, we need to make that an, an understanding with them so that it is all about, the, the goal is for us to know, understand what you're saying effectively to communicate um, what I'm saying as well so that we could collaborate together. And if we are to do this, um, there are some things that we need to leave out to the classroom. Um, yes, you could do that with your friends, but in the classroom, so that we can understand each other better, we need to have some, some standards and some boundaries uh, when communicating. And it may not be for every class. Um, there are classes where you may want it. For if you're doing English, for instance, it's necessary that you do that. So there are some classes where you want to build that standard, you want to build that discipline. There are other classes where it is more in a discussion type environment that you may have a, an allowance for that um, just to get the expression from them. I'm thinking you're opening up. Uh, well, I, I can't say if educators have been looking at this because I'm not in their position per se, but it definitely opens up an interesting discussion for them to have in terms of what outcome do I want? Do I just need to get my message across, my instruction across as an educator or what do I want then to receive from my students? Because online class, as convenient as you said, it's probably not always the best thing, but as convenient as it is right now, may not be the best solution for our children going forward in terms of a long-term solution. 
I, I know the two might work for, let's say for example for me. We're having, some of us are having online meetings. I love online meetings. I love the comfort of not having to leave home and to go to the office or go to have a meeting somewhere. But it's not always practical to have an online meeting. There's some things that you must do in person that are mm. not must do, but are better executed in person. And that's light in the classroom. So while online teaching, I get, as a teacher, as an educator, get my message out there, the child in return maybe is not getting then that full 100% in terms of getting the full education, as in, as you say, because education is not just hearing the lesson. It's not just receiving the message of do this, do that, whatever is entailed in the classroom setting, but it, it, the other parts that we don't think about, as you just said, is the communication skills that are necessary. The social skills that are necessary because there are lots of social skills that go on as well in the classroom setting that you're not going to get in online setting and I actually want to come back to that as well so before i digress too far social skills now because these social skills are something that's also lacking in an online setting i do not first of all this there is social skills for online period but then there is social skills for developmental social skills that perhaps a lot of our children are missing out on in terms of interacting with other children in a classroom setting. If I'm home alone, I don't have to worry about that and how to be polite and how to, you know, those kind of things. So what do you say about how is it affecting social skills? Um, I, I think there, there are a lot of studies that are going into this and how social media is impacting our social skills. Um, there's one um, set of research that looks at, for instance, uh, with social media, you have the whole idea of I like or I don't like. So in other words, the like button is like an approval of something. So some people are looking into it is, are we creating a culture where there is a, like a, a black and white sort of situation where if you don't like my post, you are a hater or you are against it or whatever. And, or if you don't like my post, um, you don't approve of what I said. So these are all things that may be impacting us and impacting how our students evaluate certain things. Um, so they're not seeing the whole idea of discussion. And when we talk about discussion, like you're presenting your views and I appreciate your views and I'm responding to that and I'm presenting my views and we're listening, is more a situation of I present and um, do you like or dislike? And if you say something that I may not approve of, um, I see that as a, a strike against what I said, so therefore um, I'm going to block you and or, or I'm, I'm, I don't want you on my feed. Or these are all things that when we look at it, how is it even impacting relationships, right? And, and how young people are now approaching relationships. Um, for instance, right now we know about the whole thing of online dating. And we ask young people, is online dating um, the future of relationships for them and interestingly enough they said for them and this is here locally no and I asked them why they said when we look at it because of this whole thing of the whole communication and authenticity and the social relationships and stuff online I, I really don't know who's the person behind the screen so this could be a catfisher this could be someone who is pretending to like me or and is really or says there's something and really there's someone else or pretending to like me but if i saw them face to face maybe i'll be able to get a different response or in some cases you're saying social media wants us to present our best selves or we're encouraged on social media to present our best selves so we we're presenting the best um, pose. We always have this particular smile or it's always the, the good thing about us, but we don't see the other aspects of things. So we don't see the anger. We don't see the disappointment. We don't see the discouragement. We don't see all these other expressions because we, we only highlight the good aspects of our life. So for them, it's like, I can't base a relationship. How can I build a, a, a good relationship, a quality relationship, if I don't get to evaluate, or I'm only seeing one side of you, or is this really you based on what you present? Or, I mean, I might see someone 
and they may look good from the top up and this is their their expression and then when i see them in real life they're four feet tall or whatever you know so and, and then the whole idea now of even in terms of how that is impacting how we look at beauty and how we look at all these things is a, is a whole other ball game so i think social media is impacting us more than we believe as we look at social skills as we look at how we relate to each other and as we started off by saying, are we being genuine with how we communicate online? Are we being authentic? Are we being effective with that? Especially as social media is setting the standards for our communication. You talked about the likes and dislikes of social media and how needing to not offend. How can... Is it possible then for an issue of cyberbullying to occur out of this this culture of of I guess liking this like in see I like something not because I like it per se but because you know I don't want to be the only person who does not like it or I don't want to feel offended if I don't like your post but can I do the other can I bully you by everything you put out there on social media I am. I don't know, hitting that or dislike you. Is it a dislike button? I don't recall. But um, yeah, is, is there there, some some bullying? platforms have a dislike button? Right. So, so, uh, so, so can cyberbullying come in there? In definitely, Sub, cyberbullying is a major thing right now. Um, it is said that um, eighty percent of persons who are online um, may come into some form of cyberbullying or some type of depression because of things that are happening on social media. And we see a situation where, for instance, in a physical environment, we do, we do have bullying. But in a, in a digital environment, no. What happens is that sometimes I may not be physically able to respond or to defend myself or whatever if I'm being attacked. Or I may not be able to handle it verbally. But with a digital platform, because of being behind the screen... I get to even put on a persona or start to pick on people who, because of this separation from a physical standpoint or from a social standpoint, I may conduct myself differently. So you may have children who cyber bully other children. Um, they may not say verbally in a classroom or they may not do things face to face, but they use the internet. They use these social media platforms to bully other children, to, to say certain things, to comment on certain things. Or they use the, the, the graphics generators, the photo generators to doctor certain things. And what people need to realize is that this is something, as, as teachers, we need to monitor. Because cyberbullying impacts the mental health of a lot of children. And because of cyberbullying, they may start to detach themselves even from the digital classrooms. Because when they come into that classroom, uh, if, especially if the bullying occurred in a group chat or even in, occurred in a chat at some point in time, they may become less responsive. They, they don't want to, um, to communicate. They may, they may want to shy away from responding or saying anything because for them, um, there is that threat or there is that embarrassment that is there um, from other students. Uh, so so it is something that we need to monitor, yes, because of uh, how it can impact learning, how it can impact the mental health of children. Um, but we also need to monitor it because Barbados has the Computer Misuse Act. And even though computer cyberbullying is not something that is on the books, there are a lot of things that are associated with cyberbullying um, that we need to monitor. So the whole aspect of threatening someone, harassing someone, um, saying those things that are, are basically can make you liable to, to certain things. These are all things that violate the act. And um, we, we are not even going to get into sexing, which is all part of, could be part of cyberbullying too, but the act also speaks to the whole idea of sexting, uh, which is sending sexually explicit photos, videos, or texts and so on. Uh, that is, that's another talk. But all these things we have to be aware of because that is the language. And from the digital world, if we monitor those things, we can a, a lot of the time see what is happening in the minds and in the lives of children. A lot of them use statuses to express how they feel, express what they're going through emotionally. And as teachers, 
if we see those things or as parents when we see those things these are indicators of what might be happening even if they are not expressing it verbally and i'm glad you said that about um teachers monitoring cyber bullying because i was going to ask that question i was going to ask how i know how we can monitor bullying at school in a school setting but how then do we monitor it online and you would have answered that because i wanted to know if it can happen on social media itself but i'm sh pretty sure if in the classroom itself it can be easily shut down but you would have mentioned the lingering effects of how if i say something in class and then it can go away in the chat room or it's posted all over the make sport at you so then you come to class and you don't want to talk mm -hmm. or you might not even want to show up for class after a while because yep. if i'm not going to speak what is saying to come in class the student only make fun at me and if I talk, they, they make fun. If I don't talk, they make fun. So I can see possibly how some children refuse to even come up for online, come to online classes because of social bullying. So that's interesting. Yes. Cyberbullying. So that's interesting. Yeah. You have to, as, as a teacher in today's classroom, especially in the online classroom, sometimes some teachers may get in the, um, you're focused on what you're doing. Mm -hmm. you're, you're teaching the class. You're giving out instructions. And in the background in the chat in this chat log students are commenting students are saying certain things and sometimes it could be um along the line of what you're teaching but other times it could be totally distant to to what you're talking about and as a teacher now what you have to do is you not only have to monitor um what is being said in class from a verbal standpoint and what you're communicating but you also have to start going through some of these chat logs to see what is actually being said on the site and what are the indicators to that. This child may have an issue with this or maybe going through that. So it is actually putting more responsibility on the teacher now, not only in terms of teaching the class and, and, and monitoring what children may verbally say, but understanding that what they text in the class also has weight to how children respond. And you talked about short codes earlier. So for me, as a teacher who is a little removed from the youth and in terms of where they're at with their codes and what they mean, mm -hmm. they could be putting uh, all these short codes meaning in the text. And I am seeing these letters and I am clueless as a teacher as to what this means. So there could be serious cyberbullying going on in the chat. And I am monitoring the chat and I still not have a clue what is happening because of short codes or emojis. Or because you know certain things, symbols and mm -hmm. things mean different things. So that's quite interesting. How can a teacher monitor a, a log? You're talking about a chat log. How can then they, okay, I can't do that while I'm teaching. I need to be teaching. I can run, run through the log while I'm teaching. Yes, but I cannot go through every single thing that is said and still get my lesson across right. in the period of 30, 35 minutes. Mm -hmm. What can they do to keep that log to maybe say, look at it later? Like, you basically said you have to, uh, before, in some cases, before turning off the class, um, you may want to go through the chat log before uh, exiting. Like if you, most of the classes are done on Google Meet. Mm -hmm. So before exiting, especially if you saw a lot of, um, a lot of text and so on, you may want to review it. Or you can copy it and, and save it for later. But I do encourage teachers, especially when dealing with certain things, um, to you may have to look at these chat logs and just, just skim through it to see if there's something happening that may be an indicator that a child may be going through a problem or not exactly um, getting what is being said. Or there may be some aspect of cyberbullying in there. And, and it's not only for teachers, it's also for parents. Uh, because there are other dangers that social media present um, um, from the standpoint of sexting. I, I mentioned sexting to some extent before. And when we talk about sexting, we're not just talking about young people in relationships together, but we're also talking about those persons who are catfishers or predators and who would use these short codes, who would use these emojis and texts to, um, to hide certain things away from um, parents. So for instance, we mentioned about the PMs and DMs, but there are other codes that are indicators that teachers or parents would know, would indicate that there's something else going on here. So if you see, for instance, um, persons may use a short code KPC or PAW or POS or PIR, those are usually indicators that 
this person is being groomed into the child is being groomed into not divulging anything to a trusted adult. So KPCs means basically keep parents clueless. Uh, PAW means parents are watching. So predators would use that to say, like, hey, let me know anytime the parent is in the room so that I would, would not text at this point in time or I would not say certain things or type certain things um, in the event that they come and look at the device or anything like that. Or POS, which means parent over shoulder or PIR, parents in the room. And so they use this. And what they would do, for instance, is that they would use the child's emotional language to build that connection at first. And sometimes what they would do as a predator, they would say things like, they would share something that is presumably private about them and say, I want you to keep this between me and you. And they may be, come out and be private with something and try to get the child to realize that I'm being transparent to you. I'm building trust. And then I want you to reciprocate that. I'm sharing things that are private. So please, I'm not sharing it with your parents or whatever. So please keep this between us. And that sets the platform for them now to start to groom them and in order to build that disconnect. I, I want you to trust me more than I, you trust your teacher or more than you trust your mother or father. Uh, so these are things that we see happening. And then they could get very sexual um, in, in terms of encouraging the child to get into sexually explicit activity. So you may see short codes like ASLP or ASL, um, ASL, which is basically send me your age, your sex, your location, and a photo, all right? And then you have um, Netflix and chill. And people may say, well, Netflix and chill, everybody knows Netflix and we just chilling, we come in to watch a movie and chilling. But when you really look at the meaning, especially for young people, Netflix and chill means let's come on the pretense of watching a movie to have sexual um, intercourse or to make out. These are all things that parents and teachers, when they look into these chat rooms or when they look into these social media logs or these chats, these are indicators that something may be happening. We have GNOC, get naked on camera. And these are all things that these predators use. And these are things, a lot of people think that this is only happening overseas. This is not happening in Barbados. And this is not true. Our children are telling us that they are predators, that they see contact in them on social media. They do see some of these terms being used um, in these chats, uh, persons trying to lure them um, with these things. So these are things that are present. And we unfortunately know of cases here in Barbados where um, catfishers have Catfishing had led to a one um, young lady taking, taking down her guard and unfortunately being sexually assaulted by someone she met online. Um, so this is, this is something that is real and that we need as parents and as teachers to be monitoring because of the threats that exist out there. Okay, well, we're just about out of time for today. So I'm going to ask you in the next 60 seconds to wrap up any important thing that you have left out but first i'm not sure if we had defined what a catfisher is in a previous session and we have mentioned it several times in this session so even if we have for anyone who's listening for the first time can you tell us again what is a catfisher and then proceed to say in 60 seconds any last you know, important points. Well, I'm going to ask you for um, 90 seconds. The reason why is that I, I, I didn't say what a catfisher was. No, I did not express what sexting is. I, I, I got ahead of myself. So a catfisher is basically someone who pretends to be someone else. So they put on a false persona online in order to lure you into some fraud or to get private information to you or can learn you into uh, basically sexually explicit favors or, 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 or information. So that is what a catfisher is, someone who pretends to be someone else online. So we have, you can have predators who are adults that are pretending to be teenagers or to be children online in order to build a relationship with our children. Or in, in many cases, a lot of our children are, are catfishers themselves because they lie about their age in order to get access to certain things. So online, for instance, some social media platforms, you cannot have access to that unless you're at the age of 13. And in order to get access to those platforms, they will lie about their age. So catfishing is not only in terms of um, the adults who will want to do certain things to manipulate, but the, the culture of that can be seen with children who want to have access to things that they shouldn't have access to, so they're lying about who they are. 
And sexing is basically the use of uh, internet or mobile device for creating, sharing, sending, or posting sexually explicit messages or images of yourself or of others. And especially as it relates to a minor, uh, this is against the law under the Computer Misuse Act, and it carries a fine, and it carries um, some level of imprisonment. And so children, even if I'm a, if it's a minor who is groomed to send a sexual photo, whether it's by another minor or by an adult, um, taking that photo and sending it may also be um, something that they may get in trouble for. And obviously it violates some schools in terms of their rules and so on. So these are things that we need to be aware of. Um, so as I close today, um, I, in all that we discussed, I think we have to look at the question is, in, when we go on social media, are we being safe? Are we being authentic? Are we being genuine with how we communicate online? Are we being positive with our communication? Because um, with the be, being behind the screens and sometimes the culture that we see and the, the, the ease or the convenience of hiding ourselves, hiding our expressions, hiding our identity can lead us into um, something that is not really genuine, not really healthy for us in terms of developing good social skills and healthy relationships. Um, so that is what I would say. And that teachers need to recognize that with this whole idea of texting and so on, that this is a language that young people use to express how they feel and what they're going through. And it usually can be used as an indicator to what is happening to them. It can impact their learning in terms of cyberbullying. It can impact their mental health in terms of depression and so on. And it could also be an indicator of their safety if their safety may be in threat. I am so sorry that we are out of time already because I would really love to go down the road more with the mental health issue. Well, we, we do have media. one more episode. <laughs> yeah, so if we're going to spend our time on that, that would be great. But looking mostly at our young people in terms of, as you wrapped up, I heard it, looking mostly at our young people and not being them on authentic selves on social media, having the pressure of being what is expected of me as a young person, as a teen, as a female, as a male, as a whatever on social media. We know social media tends to show your best self. So it only shows you on your height. Oh, I'm having a grand time doing this. I am doing this and I'm wearing this and I'm going this place. But really and truly you're all alone or you're sad or you're depressed. And our young people can be there, can possibly be there, but no one knows. And for me, that's heart wrenching. And yeah, so guidance counselors who who are not being able to physically reach out with our children anymore. I, I'm not even sure how they're doing it. So, but a lot of our children are being unreached. So, Arnella, I want to thank you for another interesting, thought-provoking session today. And we look forward to next time having you as you wrap up in this very interesting series on social media, toxic or transformational. It's thank a pleasure you. to be here.